Good morning. This is Solomon Jones on 900 AM, 96.1 FM WURD in Philadelphia. And we're joined by uh, senior advisor for the Joe Biden campaign, Simone Sanders. Simone, good morning. How are you? Good morning, Solomon. Good to be with you. Yes, yeah, good to have you. So I want to dive right in because one of the things that, that I hear from people in the community um, a lot more than I thought I would is there's no difference between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. Mm. What would you say mm. if something like that? Well, look, I would say I think there's a huge difference between uh, Joe Biden and Donald Trump. And I think you just have to look at the leadership or the lack thereof, frankly, of President Trump himself. Look, Donald Trump is somebody that it always puts himself first. Uh, we've seen that throughout this pandemic, COVID-19. Uh, Donald Trump has been more, I mean, even today in the news, we're hearing that in, of reports that President Trump knew of the effects, how bad COVID-19 was and did nothing about it, told folks to downplay it. Uh, why? Because it would benefit him politically. That stands in staunch opposition and frankly to everything that Joe Biden is about. Vice President Biden is somebody that is empathetic, that cares about the people, that has dedicated his life to service. And I think um, a president to Joe Biden and a vice president Kamala Harris uh, would be a, a, a dynamic duo, as I like to say, that folks can hold accountable. We have seen that Donald Trump uh, is not a president one can hold accountable because he doesn't care about the American people. So I would just ask folks to take a really hard look at the policies and the proposals Vice President Biden is putting forth. And I think you'll see uh, there is no, there's leaps and bounds, okay, on opposite ends of the spectrum between himself and Donald Trump. So there's a, a, a six point plan that the Biden campaign has put together called Lift Every Voice. It's mm -hmm. a black agenda. I'm wondering, because I looked at, at the agenda, I, I thought it was, was interesting, but I wonder who the campaign talked to. Who did Joe Biden talk to in the community in, in putting together that agenda? I mean, uh, that agenda was really informed by a wide array of voices over a number of months. And I will tell you, it didn't stop at Lift Every Voice, um, the Biden plan for Black America. I think folks should remember that uh, we also put out our Build Back Better plan. And the fourth plank of that plan was specifically and squarely about racial equity and talking about how all of the investments Vice President Biden had put forth, how those investments would be specifically directed and would specifically benefit African-American, Latino, Asian American, Pacific Islander, and Native American communities. And so who did he speak to? He spoke to civil rights leaders, but he also spoke to young people. He spoke to, to folks in Philly and states. I, you know, we spent a lot of time in Philadelphia, a lot of time in the state of Pennsylvania across the board. Uh, and every single time Vice President Biden is there hearing from uh, not just elected officials, but real people. So I would say that this really, this this document is a, is a living, uh, document, as we like to say, meaning that obviously we're constantly adding to it. I think once we put out our, our Lift Every Voice agenda, it was shortly after that. This agenda came out in the beginning of May. Shortly after that, the world found out the name of George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor and Tatiana Jefferson and Rayshard Brooks. And the Vice President Biden then went and gave a speech in Philadelphia specifically about this moment, about uh, criminal justice reform and policing, where he spoke about knowing that it's past time to put justice in criminal justice, knowing that America has never really truly lived up to its ideals of equal justice under the law for black and brown people in this country. But we can start right now. And so I would say, uh, that anybody that heard that speech, anybody that's heard Vice President Biden specifically over the last couple of months, uh, absolutely understands that um, his 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 words and his actions are one genuine, um, but two, obviously, it is he is really thinking about this deeply, and that means obviously having conversations with folks. Mm -hmm. So, um, the the plan has uh, economic mobility. It talks about expanding access to high quality education fixing racial health disparities, strengthening America's commitment to justice, protecting the right to vote and addressing environmental justice. Um, from a city like Philadelphia, where we have a 25% poverty rate, frankly, mm -hmm. most of the people living in poverty are, are black and brown people. Given that the economic disparities are systemic, they go way beyond government. Mm -hmm. Going to the bank and not being able to get a loan that a white person with the same credit can get. It's 
you know, um, not being able to get the same job, not being able to advance on that job. Like it goes way beyond just government. How do you address the economic problems that we have specifically in a black community in a city like Philadelphia? So Solomon, if Vice President Biden were here, he would tell you that he believes that America has reached an inflection point. And, you know, John Lewis said in his final challenge to our nation, ordinary people with extraordinary vision can redeem the soul of America. The soul of America is the reason that Vice President Biden ran in the first place, to restore that soul. And so restoring that soul means that uh, something we've been saying for a while, and not just building back, but building back better than we were before, more equitable, more just, more inclusive than we ever have been. That is going to take um, an execution uh, with meticulous surgical precision, as we like to say. But I mean, look, it, we often talk about uh, the four crises from our vantage point that America is experiencing. You spoke about one of those, an economic crisis, but we're also currently living through a, a public health crisis, a climate crisis, and a, and a crisis of racial injustice. Uh, it's just not attacking one of those issues over the other, especially for uh, a city like Philadelphia. It is going to take um, us, us attacking on all fronts on day one. So in the first 100 days, like these are all things that Vice President Biden and Senator Harris will be focused on. So specifically, when we talk about racial equity, um, it is central, in our opinion, to our economic recovery. We have to break the cycle. We, I mean, you spoke about this. In good times, uh, communities of color, Black communities, they lag behind. And in bad times, it's our community that is hit first and hardest. COVID-19 is disproportionately affecting the African-American community in this country. All over uh, this country, Philadelphia knows this story all too well. So Vice President Biden wants to make sure that every family, especially African-American families, have affordable housing and a path to home ownership. Uh, we've talked a lot about in that plan about small businesses, um, specifically making sure the small businesses owned by African-American, Latino folks and other people of color have the access to capital that they need because capital is important. During this pandemic, one in six small businesses have had to shutter their doors. Those are, those are families. Those are, that, that is uh, an opportunity that is lost to build um, and close that wealth gap and build institutional generational wealth. So we've got all, all types of plan, in our opinion, that specifically speak to the issue at hand and isn't a, isn't a quick fix or Band-Aid. This mm. is something that gets to the root of the issue because as Vice President Biden believes, this is an opportunity we really have to fix some of these systemic issues that we've known about for a really long time, frankly, and that COVID-19 in this current moment have just really shown a spotlight on. Well, criminal justice, I, I wanna talk about that because mm -hmm. that, a huge issue uh, in our community, Kenosha, Wisconsin. Yeah, Jacob Blake shot seven times in the back by police. He's paralyzed from the waist down. George Floyd uh, killed by police uh, in Minneapolis. You had uh, Daniel Prude um, killed by police in, in Rochester. And so we see this not just in one place, but we see mm -hmm. this repeatedly across the country. Um, given that a, a lot of people, when they look at Joe Biden, they see the 1994 crime bill, they see mass incarceration coming after that. Now he's talking about police reform. H how do you, how do you reconcile the, that Joe Biden that, that a lot of people know from the Joe Biden we see now talking about police reform? Well, I would say you actually have to, I mean, given this moment that we're in, Solomon, we talk, we're talking about police reform, but there's also a larger criminal justice reform issue on the table. And we just spoke about economics. We know that if you only address the issues as it relates to criminal justice reform, and we don't address the economic issues, um, these are not issues that are separate. They are intertwined. And so if we only address criminal justice reform, we're only addressing part of the problem. I will tell you that uh, in Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, I think there's not a better duo to uh, really address the issues at this moment. And I say that because Senator Harris, as a prosecutor, uh, went into work inside the system um, to make it better um, for all people, but especially people that look like her. Joe Biden, who was a public defender uh, before being elected into office. Now, yes, we talk about the 94 crime bill. There were some uh, good things in that crime bill and some not so good things. One of the good things, a ban on assault weapons, Violence Against Women Act. Um, I would also argue, though, the current, the only mechanism we actually have in this country to hold police officers accountable was written into the crime bill. 
pattern of practice investigations. Under a Biden administration, he would expand those pattern of practice investigations um, that allow us to hold rogue police departments accountable to include prosecutors' offices. Because, you know, as he will tell you, and Senator Harris will tell you, the prosecutors hold a lot of power here, and they too uh, need to, we need to look under the hood and what's happening there. So let me tell you about what will happen in the first 100 days, because these are commitments that Joe Biden has made. You don't have to wonder about where he stands on this. He's made these commitments. He said he'll create a police oversight commission, and that will include civil rights leaders. It will include, yes, police officers and experts in criminal justice reform and policing reform. He'll get every police department in the country to overtake a comprehensive review of their hiring, training, and de-escalation practices. And that's important because we keep seeing um, instance after instance in various places all over the country. And it always comes back to, uh, you know, sometimes it comes back to hiring. Sometimes it comes back to the practices. A lot of times it comes back to a, a lack of a, uh, a use of force standard across the board. That is something a Biden-Harris administration would institute. Um, he is going to commit that uh, his Justice Department will uh, have the resources that they need to really seek out and meet justice in this country, including investigating systemic police misconduct and requiring reform. So these are commitments, I'll tell you, that he's made. So ask, ask yourselves, <laughs> when we look at uh, who, what we have um, before us in this election, we have a president currently under Donald Trump who has done nothing but pour gasoline uh, and fan the flames of tension on, in this moment that we're currently experiencing. Then we have Joe Biden, who's listening, who's hearing communities. That's what he did when he went to Kenosha and who is making a commitment to create change. Mm -hmm. So I'm really concerned about, about what's going to happen with Black folks, right? Because mm. right now, we are dealing with an atmosphere that, that I've never seen in my life. I'm not mm -hmm. some spring chicken. So, I, so I've been around for a minute. And I've never seen anything like this uh, with the racial tension that we're seeing across the country. Now, Joe Biden's campaign was floundering before he went to South Carolina, and, and frankly, Black voters really saved his campaign. We yeah. appreciate South Carolina, Solomon. It's a good All place. Right. It's a good I'm just place. Saying, that's where my people from now to appreciate. Yes. yes, yes. <laughs> so, so given that reality, that that Black voters were were such a key part of really saving his campaign. What does Joe Biden owe to our community? Well, look, I think folks have to remember that Vice President Biden, you know, you are no spring chicken, Solomon, and neither is Joe Biden. You know, in him, I think folks can see a leader that has really spent his whole career fighting with and for uh, Black families and families of color throughout this country. He's a leader who values faith, who values community, who values family. He's a leader who's running on, on hope and truly a hope for the future where all Black people will have access to good jobs, good schools, and good doctors. I, I mean, I just have to keep coming back to this pandemic. Uh, it is us who are disproportionately being affected. And the lack of a plan from the current president of the United States, um, his unwillingness to do anything uh, to help mitigate and get this virus under control, it is African-American communities in this country. It is Black folks in Philadelphia and the state of Pennsylvania across the board uh, who are suffering most and frankly, who have the most to lose. So I'll tell you that Vice President Biden has put forth this plan. We talked about it. And his is a plan that, yes, uh, addresses these criminal justice reform issues. It, it addresses over-policing and systemic racism in our communities. But it's a plan that ensures equity for Black people across the board, in healthcare, uh, in education. It is a plan that helps remove the barriers that block us in different venues, such as small businesses, from having a fair shot in our economy. So this is a plan that will expand access to high quality education and STEM and make public universities tuition free for low income communities. And frankly, a plan that invests more money in historically black colleges and universities and minority serving institutions than any other presidential candidate that was running for office this cycle or the cycle before. So mm -hmm. Joe Biden's plan, it's, it's not a piece of paper. I call it a living document. This is his commitment that he has made to the African American community. And we, we are asking folks to get out there and vote, vote early, make your plan to vote because Joe Biden or Kamala Harris are two people you can hold accountable and then hold us accountable on the promises and the commitments that he has made to the community because it is right there for the world to see. So in, in 2016, you, you were with Bernie Sanders and, and there was a lot of um, enthusiasm around his campaign, a lot of enthusiasm around it this time. You decided to go with Joe Biden. Now, a lot of the people who, who are angry still 
uh, are people who supported Bernie Sanders. I want to ask you as somebody who's worked with both of them, you know, what do you see in, in Joe Biden that, uh, that, that should, the, the Sanders voters should know? So I will say, I will say two things. So one, we are, I want to lead with that. I am very grateful for the experience I had on Senator Sanders campaign in 2016. And knowing everything that I know right now, Solomon, I would sign up to do it all over again, the same way I did in 2015. Mm -hmm. And I, I say that because um, the work that Senator Sanders did is, is not only to be commended, but it is work that is still continuing to this day. We are very happy to have um, not just his endorsement in this race, but his active participation. You know, I, I hope folks, um, if they didn't see Senator Sanders live during the Democratic National Convention, that they pull up that video of him um, and his remarks, because they were just very clear. He gave a very forceful case about why Joe Biden would be good for the progressive agenda, but also why a Biden administration is one we have to get in office so that we can move through all of these very, uh, you know, uh, pro progressive things that we've been talking about. And when it comes to education, when it comes to uh, building on the success of Obamacare. So the second thing though I'll say is that I went to go work for Vice President Biden because when I had a, the, my first opportunity in having a conversation with him, um, came after I spoke to many people that were running for president this cycle. As you remember, there were more than 20 folks, Solomon. There's a lot of folks. Right. And when, in our conversation, he said something to me that no one else said. He, in my opinion, correctly diagnosed what America was going through. In my first conversation with him, well before he had announced uh, that he was running for president, he said that he was running because what he was seeing from Donald Trump and his administration was an abuse of power. And he can't sit by and let an abuse of power go unchecked. He talked about this notion of being in a battle for the soul of this nation and that we have to do all this work to rebuild the backbone of the country and unite America. And in that moment, I thought it was very interesting because I had not heard anyone articulate what America was experiencing uh, like that before. Now, as we sit here on Zooms across the country, wearing masks every time we leave the house, social distancing when we go to the grocery store, using that hand sanitizer, it's very clear, okay, that we need to do work to rebuild the backbone of this country as you as we see um, the, as I like to say, the bowels of the internet that harbor white supremacy now spilled out into the open, marching through the streets of this country, it's very clear that we're in the battle for the soul of this nation. It was not that clear more than a year and a half ago, but Joe Biden correctly diagnosed what America was going through. And I just felt like he understood this moment. And I will say that the message that he started this race with is the message that he has continued to have throughout the primary process. And this is the message that we are taking all the way to November third. All right. So this will be my last question for you, because uh, I asked you about the difference uh, between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. And one of the starkest differences, as, as you pointed out, um, is, is their temperament. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that, that I think is concerning, uh, talking about the battle for the soul of this country and white supremacy being out in the open and racism being uh, practiced in the way that it is, some of the things that the president is saying is, is setting up a, a confrontation after mm -hmm. this election. He's talking about the mail-in ballots being corrupt. He's talking about uh, sending poll watchers to the polls because there's going to be thievery and, and robbing and stealing at the polls. And, um, and, and he also said that if he loses, it'll be because the election was rigged. Given the atmosphere that we're dealing with and, and, and what the president is doing to stoke that, how does Joe Biden bring the country together after this election should he win? So look, Solomon, first I will say that it is a travesty what Donald Trump is doing to attempt to undermine voters' confidence and faith in our elections. You know, the cornerstone of American democracy are free, fair, and open elections. But every time Donald Trump uh, questions, uh, you know, questions if, uh, you know, mail-in ballots are safe or questions if too many people have voted or just cast any type of disparagement and doubt over our elections, he's threatening. He's threatening that cornerstone of our democracy. And so I think the best way to, the best way to beat Donald Trump is to send him, that the people can prove him wrong. The best way to beat Donald Trump, frankly, is to elect Joe Biden. And we're trying to do that work. But the people can prove Donald Trump wrong by going to the ballot box and making a plan to vote early. So we're encouraging folks to go to IWillVote.com to make your plan to not just vote, but make your plan to vote early and make sure you can participate in this democracy. 
Joe Biden is offering a different vision, Solomon. And I know it seems um, kind of, uh, you know, far-fetched, if you will, to in this moment talk about uniting the country, given how much chaos and division that this president has sowed. But the reality is that Americans have, you know, this isn't the first election we've had since 2016. And I think in election after election, cycle after cycle, since the last presidential, voters have gone to the ballot box and made their, their, their desires clear and known. In 2018, voters all across this country, places in Philadelphia, in the suburbs of Pennsylvania, went to the ballot box and said they wanted to put a check on this president and they wanted to elect some folks to the United States Congress who could get things done. And that's how Nancy Pelosi came back to being Speaker Pelosi. We truly believe that uh, this is another opportunity for us to come together as Americans. And Joe Biden is going to lead that charge. He's going to bring Americans together to address these challenges that our country faces. In the Joe Biden's America, folks are going to be safe from COVID, Solomon. They're going to be safe from an economy in the free fall. Folks are going to be safe from attacks on Social Security and the Affordable Care Act, and with it, the attacks on uh, pre-existing conditions. Joe Biden's going to codify that. All right. We are going to do the work. So I would just tell folks that, um, you know, what we're, this, this moment that we're experiencing, this Donald Trump's America that we're living through, it does not have to be this way. And on November 3rd, or even before November 3rd, Solomon, because I think folks are going to vote early, mm -hmm. people have an opportunity to change that. All right. That is Simone Sanders. She is Senior Advisor to the Joe Biden Campaign for President. I want to thank you for joining us today on WURD. Thank you for having me. I will come back soon. All right.